Awkward. Awkward. <laughs> all right, are we all ready? Yes. I'm almost ready. Seems like the Wi-Fi is not working real great in here today. We're okay. Today is all about salt and I'm hot we're gonna look at some scripture to start off with I love you guys We're going to look at three scriptures to start, to start off this morning. We're going to start with Matthew 5.13. So in this section of scripture, Jesus has been preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And I talked about this in my last sermon a couple weeks ago, uh, the Servant King. We talked about Jesus talking about who is the blessed. Who are the blessed? So he finishes this section on who the blessed are. And then he says this, Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now we're going to look at Mark 9, 49 and 50. Now in this section, Jesus has been again teaching on servanthood and discipleship. He then begins to warn about hell. And here we find this scripture, Mark 9, 49 and 50. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourself, and have peace with one another. Our next section we're going to look at is Luke 14, 35 to 34 to 35. Luke 14, 34 to 35. Jesus is again teaching about discipleship. So in each of these three scriptures, Jesus is teaching on discipleship. And here he's been teaching on counting the cost of following him. Luke 14, 34 to 35. Salt is good. I say amen. I love salt. <laughs> so yummy. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. Did you know your Bible talked like that? But men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Lord, we pray that our ears are open this morning that our hearts are open this morning, that our eyes are open this morning to your word. Tell us what it is that you would like us to understand and know about you and know about us, Lord God. What is your call on our lives? How are we to walk through this world? Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Have you ever noticed, I'm sure you have, you are uh, well-seasoned uh, uh, Christians, have you ever noticed how often Jesus teaches on um, things that, that the common person of the day can relate to? So D Jesus didn't come in and, you know, talking about newfangled something or others that, you know, had to do with uh, uh, some, you know, glorious technology over here that the Romans had or what he's teaching about. He's teaching using illustrations that everyday people walking through his his world would understand. I mean, after all, who's the first people he goes and he calls to? They're fishermen. So most of the disciples that are walking with him are men who are working in natural resources. I always like to say if Jesus came, if, if the Bible setting was changed and it was, you know, now Jesus was coming now um, and he came to uh, Sutherland, he would call on the loggers and, and they would be his disciples and he'd go to the coast and he'd call the fishermen and the, the crab pot guys and they would be his disciples. He would call on the farmers and the ranchers, they would be his disciples. So when he came, he came into an agrar agrarian culture that was active in fishing out of the, out of the, the lakes and the seas that, that were there. And they were, they were growing uh, grains, crops, raising sheep, goats, chickens, probably. Yes, they were, because he had illustrations out of all of these things. So here he's, he's using illustrations of salt. So today, in Salt 101, you are going to learn everything you ever wanted to know about salt. Because you probably didn't want to know much more than it's yummy. And it makes everything delicious. My point in talking about Jesus and the illustrations that he used is that Jesus isn't only for the special people. He's, he's for all of us. But he makes us special if we follow him. Jesus is not just for the fancy ones. I'm not fancy, and Jesus loves me. He makes me fancy. He will someday. We'll all be fancy in his, in his kingdom with our fancy crowns. So let's talk about salt. In the culture of Jesus' day, salt was pretty important. And everyone would be very familiar with the importance of salt. It's, it was different than it is now. Salt at this time had been used for, for thousands of years. Uh, 6,000 years before Christ, uh, archaeologists now have found salt works all across the world. Romania, Egypt, China. The, actually, there's a salt work. It's not that old. But if you go to uh, uh, the Oregon coast, Seaside, there's a salt works in Seaside that's been preserved it's where Lewis and Clark uh, set up an operation to make salt. Salt was pretty important. And again, that's a different time, but it's still the time before pres you know, refrigeration and preservation. Salt was used for trade within the Mediterranean region, between Egypt, the Phoenicians, the Greeks, across the sea, in Italy, Rome, all through the, the region. And all through the world, salt was used as a trade. In, in fact, um, it was even used for currency. So the Romans, the, the Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt. Sal is where we get the word sal salary. It's derived from the, the, for, for the word for salt, sal, salary. Somebody who worked hard was said to be worth his salt. We still say that today. It's been around for a long time. That's how ingrained in the culture the importance of salt was. Salt was actually very valuable. 
So the nations would control the production of salt. So if there, was a, if there was a salt source, they'd control it so you couldn't produce very much at a time. What does it sound like? Currency. You control the output of currency. If you control it, you make it more valuable. Salt was used as money, trade. So by controlling the source, they, they, that helped it to have more value. There was a term uh, that you may or may not have heard. You probably didn't because you're not a salt nerd, nerd like I am. But after today, you're going to get a t-shirt that says, I'm a salt nerd too. Back in the day, there, there was a term called salt road. The salt road, you've probably heard of the silk road. Salt road, salt roads were trade routes. They were trade routes that, that were developed because of the trade of salt. So nations that could, that could cre you know, manufacture salt, produce salt, would then trade with other nations that they have these roads. There's the, and they, they would call them salt roads. Um, one of the most famous is the Via Salaria. Again, the word for salt here, um, that, that went through Italy in Rome. For 150 miles, this road ran, ran Italy's like that shoe-shaped country that sticks down into the ocean. And the salt road started at the bottom, to 150 miles up through that, that country, the Via Salera, and it's still there. You can drive on it, now it's a highway, Highway SS4, which they continue to call, at least parts of it, Via Salaria. I wanna go drive on that road and eat some salt while I'm driving. In the region of Israel, where Jesus was teaching, salt was produced near Jerusalem in the Dead Sea. I've got a couple pictures of this. Renee, if you could put those up. And it was, it, was for, it, was, it was harvested out of evaporation pools. So in the Dead Sea, um, you, many of you probably know that this is a, that, that's actually natural salt deposits. The Dead Sea is so salty that it, it, it's actually evaporating. And as it evaporates, it leaves behind these salt deposits. And for sea salt, that's actually how you make sea salt. You, you let it evaporate. So and they've been doing this again for, for thousands of years. Uh, these are natural uh, salt deposits. They still produce salt out of here, and you can buy, go buy it in the store, dead sea salt. Uh, this is actually a, uh, um, a secret uh, aerial photo that I, that I got from NASA that shows the, uh, the, the top up there. That's the dead sea. That's the south end of the dead sea. And these sort of greenish looking pools at the bottom those are salt works. Those are salt um, evaporating pools, and they've been expanding as the Dead Sea is sort of going dry. These uh, salt evaporation pools are, are evaporating, and uh, that's a satellite view, a modern satellite view of what's going on. Change that real quick so we don't all get arrested by the NSA. I'm sure it's fine. Everything's fine. Nothing to be worried about. Salt. I have a sample here today. If I had a spoon, I'd eat it. I really like salt, right? <laughs> uh, Rick and Renee, I think you have a relative who really likes salt in your family. I believe that Lene is, is a, probably the most saltiest salt eater I've ever seen. This is salt. This is a form of salt. This is Morton salt. Where did this come from? It's a table salt, doesn't tell us where it came from. Sometimes when you buy salt, my favorite kind of salt is actually like the, 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 the sea salt that is, is still like the rocky form. I like those crunchy kind because uh, they're so delicious and you don't need as much, I think. And, I, and when, whenever Jolene cooks, then she always tells me, you might not want to salt that before you eat it. So I try to be respectful and take a bite and then put salt on it. But I like I like the crunchy kind, and that's a lot of that you can get from uh, this region, from from Israel. That's there are salt plants there. It's a, it's big business. Um, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. People go and they swim around in the Dead Sea, and you can float in it because it's it's so uh, salty, and the saline content makes you just buoyant. So you float around it, and people you know they rub the mud on their faces and, and stuff, but. It's kind of creepy to me because 
that's the end of like a river that's gone through some disgusting areas <laughs> before it gets, and some of these areas and villages don't have the most adequate, shall we say, sewage systems. And uh, so, uh, no thank you. I, I, when I go to Israel, I will not be rubbing Dead Sea mud upon my face. And I actually kind of freaks me out to buy salt from there because I'm like, I don't know about that. But I love that crunchy sea salt. Salt is actually, the, the, it's sodium chloride is the main ingredient of salt, it's chemical. And the chemical name is NaCl, if you care about that. Uh, you probably don't, and that's fine. A chemistry class is not for everybody. I made it through. NaCl, sodium chloride, it's actually essential for life. If we don't have it, we don't live. Sodium ions are essential for plant life. See, we're getting nerdy and nerdier every second that goes by. This is cool. When I, okay, I'll just keep going. Sodium uh, is, is, a, is a nutrient that's required for animal and plant, or animal and, uh, and, and human life. I'll, I won't just call us animals. Animals and, and humans, we require sodium and it's actually in our cells. So cultures that eat meat, more meat as opposed to uh, more vegetables actually don't require as much uh, salt, additional salt to survive because they're actually eating it in, in, the, in the flesh of the, of the animals. Saltiness is one of the most basic human tastes. Your, your taste buds are designed to, to taste you know, sweetness, saltiness, it's a basic taste. It's universally known, salt is universally known to improve the flavor, I say amen, the taste of food, including food that would otherwise be unpalatable, unedible. It, Job says this, Job, in 6.6, 6, Job 6.6, 6, he says, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? I say no. You're right, Job, it's yucky. Put a little bit of salt on that. You ever, you know, taste somebody's cooking and, and then you're like, eh, please pass the salt. And, you know, you can make almost everything better with a little bit of salt. That's, that's my cooking tip for the day. Now, you can put too much on there, so be careful about that. Salt was also part of binding agreements, contracts. Did you know that? I can see by your face that you did not know that, Megan. <laughs> it's a good, at some point you can go, nerds, nerds, nerds. It's okay, I get it. It was part of binding agreements. To this day in many Arab cultures, if two men ingest salt together, sit at a table, eat salt together, they just made a contract for their lives. This is still practiced today in many Arab cultures. And what that means, if they eat salt together, they're considered sworn to protect each other, even if they'd been enemies before. It's true, I looked it up, Megan. Salt, in fact, contracts were made between kings by ingesting salt together. I know you're looking at me like I'm crazy, but I'm going to get to the Bible here, and I'll prove it to you. In fact, for the Jewish people... Salt was part of the covenant. Did you know this? Part of the covenant God had made with them. In fact, he called it a covenant of salt. Boom. We see this. I'll give you the scriptures. In the Lord's instructions to Aaron regarding the support of the priests and Levites. And here's a scripture. Numbers 18.19. Numbers 18.19. This is the Lord instructing Aaron regarding how the priest, the Levitical uh, tribe, would be supported. Numbers 18, 19. Lord says, I think I gave you that, yeah. Uh, All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. 
And in Leviticus, Leviticus 2, verse 13, we see that salt was to be included with the grain offering that was given to the Lord. Part of the, part of the offering ceremony. Leviticus 2.13 and every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So Jesus wasn't just randomly making up this thing about salt. This was part of the culture. This meant something. In Second Chronicles, we are told of a war between King Abijah of Judah and King Jeroboam of Israel. 2 Chronicles 13, 3 through 5. This tells us the story of the, of the war and, and the, the scenario. So uh, Abijah set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. Jeroboam also drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men, mighty men of valor. So you got 400,000 over here. The kingdom of Judah. You've got 800,000 over here facing them, the kingdom of Israel. Then Abijah stood on Mount Zemariah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, Jeroboam, and all Israel. Should you now not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons by a covenant of salt. A covenant of salt. Why does he keep saying, why do we keep seeing this in the scripture, a covenant of salt? Because the preservative quality of salt represented an irrevocable pledge that God made with the Davidic line in this, in this case, the covenant of salt. Abijah goes on to tell Jeroboam that because God made this pledge, no amount of false worship, remember, here's Judah, that is still following the, the precepts of the Lord, following the law, and they have the temple, and they're worshiping, and here's Israel, that King Jeroboam made up his own. He's like, you guys don't have to go to Jerusalem anywhere, we'll just make up our own religion here, we're fine. That's why... King Abijah is telling him, you're wrong. Abijah goes on to tell Jeroboam, because God made this pledge, no amount of false worship is going to serve the kingdom of Israel. It's not going to work. God made a covenant of salt. It's not going to be broken. And, Ab and Abijah's army of 400,000 men goes on to defeat the 800,000 man army of Jeroboam. Because God said, amen? If God says it, it's done. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be done. It's a promise. Salt. Now you know so much more about salt. <laughs> You're very welcome. It's more than just delicious. It's wonderfully nutritious. I don't know. That sounds familiar. Let's look again at what Jesus tells us about salt and, and us. He calls us to be salty. We are to be, we're the salt of the earth. We're delicious. We are to keep our flavor, to keep our saltiness. Now I'm going to give you four salt principles. Four principles of salt. Number one, value. Number two, seasoning. Number three, purification. And number four, preservation. We're going to apply those to our, to our lives here. First, value. You and I actually are valuable to God. We have value to God. How do we know? Well, first of all, God sent his only son to die 
for us. He cares, as the word tells us, about our daily life. He loves us. We know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're so valuable that God would give his only Son for us. And listen to this. As the church, we are the bride of Christ. Do you think the groom cares about the bride? Yes, he does. Let's look at Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 25 to 30. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife himself, oh, he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. As salt of the earth, we should understand that we have value to God. We're precious in his eyes, we have value to God. He loves us, us, he loves us as a church, he loves us as Christians, he loves us as his disciples, and he loves each one of us, individually. He actually desires that each of us will spend eternity with him. And he loves us as his church in the way that a husband loves his bride. Which I can tell you is a lot. Christians, as, as Christians, we are rare. And we have great value in the kingdom of God. We're salty. Number two, seasoning. As the salt of the earth, we are to season the world. So we cannot help but walk through the world. We aren't called to just isolate ourselves and, you know, never interact with. There are some who do. That's called a cult. We're not a cult. We're Christians. We're disciples. We live and work and walk through the world. And as we do, we should be giving it flavor. Saltiness. We've been given the ultimate flavor. The ultimate seasoning. We have the word of God. We have the message of the gospel. And we're called to preach, preach the word, and to evangelize and spread the message of Jesus Christ. Salt it. Spread it. It's delicious. We have the knowledge of the living God. We should be the best saltiest salt the world has ever tasted. You think this is yummy? We're yummier.
Jesus tells us to keep our saltiness, to keep our flavor. In fact, he warns us against losing our flavor. In the three scriptures that, that I used at the beginning, these included warnings about what would happen if salt loses its flavor. It's no good anymore. What good is this if it has no flavor? It's no good. It, it's not even good, for the, good enough for the dung heap. What does that mean? You, you don't even want to put it on your dung heap. Trust me, I spent some time trying to figure out what does this mean? Why does the Bible mention a, a pile of duty and that you don't want to put your salt on the pile of duty? Well, there's, there's a reason. And I found about 20 different reasons that I don't think were right. These are people's opinions, uh, people trying to draw on, you know, historic historic things one guy said in a very long and involved uh, theological paper written for a, a seminary that salt actually wasn't salt it was like something I was like no I, I think it was salt <laughs> salt on the dung heap okay I think this is the best explanation in this time in a culture that cooked by fire and was not surrounded by a bunch of fuel. Like, if we cooked by fire, oh, that's pretty cool. We got trees growing everywhere around us. In, in some of the regions of Israel, that's not the case. So what do you cook? In many of the cultures in, in Africa and the Middle East, if, if you're a culture that, that you're an agrarian culture and you cook by fire, you actually cook dung. Okay, you have your animals and they are um, giving you some fuel. And, uh, and there's cultures that still do this. You can, you can go out and you can look at, look, at, look at Googie and you can find pictures of walls, uh, you know, rock walls, old, old soil walls, and they're covered with dried dung. So somebody's job is to go and, and pick it all up. I, I know, we'll get through this gross part. It's okay. Uh, make it a point. And they'll, and they'll flatten them out and dry them out. And then they cook them in their stoves. Do you remember there was a prophet who was called to... Do something terrible and as, as an illustration. And it was so terrible what God told him to do, which was cook with human dung. And he said, Lord, please. Like, I can't go this far. And said, God said, okay, well, you can use, you can use animal, animal dung so that, you know, it's not so offensive. But this is what the culture did. So they'd burn. Uh, I'm almost done talking about duty. They had burned the dung. But they would actually use salt with it. So they would salt it. They'd put salt on there because the chemical properties of salt would make the, uh, the fertilizer, the dung, the dried fuel, burn hotter and longer. Does that explanation make sense? <laughs> Why would he talk about that you, your salt's not even good enough for the dung heap? Well, there was a reason. And that's, I believe, makes the most sense to me, that it was an additive to fuel. But eventually, if you kept, if you kept burning it, those properties would, would fade over time. And then it's not even good for, for burning it with your, with your dung fuel. Then you just chuck it out in the road and walk on it. And actually, they often used this type of, uh, you know, used up salt, whatever, you just throw it on the roadway and, and walk on it. So you literally walked on it. And that's what Jesus said. Men would, men would trample it. It would be trampled by men. I think we've spent quite enough time talking about dung heat. Here's my point in this little section. The Lord wants us to retain our flavor. And I'm going to pray for that right now. Lord God, help us 
to retain our flavor, our seasoning, Lord. Help us to remain salty, remain flavorful, productive for you, Lord God. Let us not lose our flavor and become to the point where we're not, we're not good for anything except to be chucked out, Lord God. We want to remain flavorful. Flavorful for you, Lord God. Help us. Thank you, God. Number three of the principle of salt. Purification. Salt is a symbol of purification. So again, in our culture now, we have so many, uh, so many more things chemically and medicinally than, than you would have back in, in the culture of 0 AD, 33 AD, whatever, okay? We have a different, more advanced technology. At, at this time, um, salt was symbolic of purification. It was used medicinally uh, for this reason too. Salt is a symbol of purification, and we are to be purified in Christ. Let me give you some biblical examples of salt used for purification. Elisha used salt to purify water in a bad spring in Jericho. And you can find this story in 2 Kings 2. The men of the city came and told Elisha, uh, we have this spring in the, uh, g that gives water to the city and it's bad. We can't use it. So we, we can't even grow anything here. Elisha says, bring me a new bowl with some salt. And they bring it to him and he throws it into the water. He throws it into the spring and the water's purified. Now was it the salt in Elisha? Well, it was a symbol. What he was doing was purifying the water with salt. The Lord did the miracle. In Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel is given a word from the Lord that includes an interesting uh, discussion on the treatment of newborn babies. Check it out. It's interesting. I'm, I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but Ezekiel 16. Uh, he, it includes a description of the care of a newborn baby that's, baby that's just been born. It includes cutting the navel cord and rubbing the baby with salt. So this is thought to be a, a, a reference to purification and, and as an antiseptic to keep uh, an infection from the newborn, from the newborn from catching an infection. So they rub the body with salt. Again, different culture, different time. Exodus 30 uh, includes something that's really fascinating to me, and this is instructions for making holy anointing oil and also for making holy incense. It's interesting to me because you were not allowed to make this on your own. This was a secret, secret ingredients. You, you were not allowed to go make your own holy anointing oil and your, whole, and your own holy incense. Did you know that? Was not allowed was only to be made by the priests and only for worship. These were, these were very special. And the, the Lord tells Moses, this is in Exodus 30, and again, I'm not going to read this whole one, but uh, Exodus 30 talks about this. And the Lord tells Moses, take sweet spices, stacte and onica and galbanum and pure frankincense with these sweet spices. There shall be equal amounts of eats. You shall make of these an incense, salted, pure, and holy. This was an incense to be burned. This was not something to be eaten. So offerings that were to be eaten, we've already seen where there was a covenant of salt, and salt was added to these, but this is something to be burned, not eaten. And salt, they were to add, add that. Salted, pure, and holy. Salt was a part of the, represented the purity of, purification and as Christians we're offered purification of our sins in Christ he died for them so we can go now directly to him 
and ask him to forgive us. Did you know that? You can go directly to Christ in prayer and ask him for forgiveness of your sins. Let's do it that, right now. If you, if you have a need to be of, of something that you need to be forgiven with, let's bow our heads. Lord, purify me. Lord God, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for taking them from me, Lord God. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for purifying me, Lord God. Thank you, God. Amen. Number four, principle of salt, preservation. Salt is an excellent preserver. This is why there is a salt covenant, because it's lasting. It's a lasting covenant. Preserved. If you lived in this culture, how did you preserve your food? You didn't have a refrigerator. You didn't have a, a freezer. Salt was used to preserve it. So Peter and his fishing friends would bring in those, you know, boatloads of, of little fishies. Uh, you, you either had to scarf them all down right then, um, or, or you'd have to have some way to preserve them. So you'd probably dry them. You'd probably put some salt on them. Maybe pack them in salt. So when the little guy was, was out there and Jesus was teaching and, and, the, little boy, and, and the, the disciples say, hey, why are we going to feed these people? And the little boy's like, I got five fishes and five loaves of bread. They were probably salty, salt fish. They probably weren't, you know, freshly caught because they'd been sitting on a mountain out in the sun for quite a while. So that would not be delicious. Nobody wants to eat that. So they were probably preserved in salt. And so we, as followers of Christ, will be preserved until the end of time. Did you know that? God has given us a promise, a covenant, and his word endures. He can preserve all of us in him to the end for eternity let's look at second timothy 4 17 and 18. paul says but the lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the gentiles might hear also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, speaking about the time of his second coming, said in Matthew 24, 9 to 14, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Who can assist you in your endurance? Only God. Not even death can break his promise. And we know this because we're told this. 2 Corinthians 6, 8. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. I want to stay salty. I want to be salty. I want to be salty now and tomorrow and the next day and forever. I want to flavor and season the world. I know I have great value to God. Oh, God has greater value to me. I want to serve him. I want to be salty in this earth. I want to be purified 
by the Lord. And I've asked for, for, and we've done that in this service, I've asked for forgiveness for my sins, and I've been forgiven. If you haven't done that, do it. If you're listening, and you have not asked for forgiveness of your sins, ask for forgiveness of your sins, and God will forgive you for your sins. If you have not received salvation from God, ask Him, and He will give it to you. I want to be preserved. Salty, delicious, forever. So that one day, I can walk on streets of gold and rejoice with God. Let's pray. Lord, help us to live as we are called. Help us all to live as salt of the earth. Thank you for opening your word to us, Lord. Minister to us as we go out of this place, Lord God, and as we, as we walk out into the world, God. Let us bring our flavor everywhere we go. Let them see, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us be the flavor, God the torchbearers, a city on a hill, Father. Thank you for what you're doing with, with this body, Lord God. Lord, I pray for every single person who's in this room and who hears my voice, Lord God, be with them. Lord, quicken them. If there is, a, if, if there is someone who is listening that you are calling into a closer relationship with you, into salvation with you, Lord God, press into them, Lord, and do what needs to be done. We thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, go forth and be salty. If you want some extra salt, I got some right here. I don't think I can put it back in this thing. See you next time.